Hi, good morning. Um, this is one of the, uh, the cheapest presentations I've ever uh, ever made. It's only got three slides in for 10 minutes, so that's uh, going to be really short and sweet. Um, I worked for uh, industry for 25 years before I took one of these illustrious, as we referred to earlier on, industrial research chairs at university. The aim of going there and solving everybody's problems, including all the ones that I'd identified while I was working in industry. And I, I must say that after um, 25 years in industry and uh, three and a half years now in academia, um, it all leaves you feeling very jaded at the end with a bad taste because you don't see a great deal of things, um, a great deal of things changing. Uh, three slides here, looking at three uh, topics very quickly. Technology, there's one on uh, research and development, and there's one talking about, um, briefly about strategy. Uh, I, I think we expect a, a phenomenal amount from uh, technology. Uh, we sometimes uh, seem to be expecting that uh, technology is going to give us some sort of quantum leap, that we're going to wake up one morning and some device um, is going to be sitting there that's going to allow us to, uh, to astonishingly tell from the surface exactly what the grade, size, etc. of an old body is. And certainly there are some, uh, some Russian vendors around who will try and sell you that type of technology. But in reality, um, I think most technology that we look at is, uh, is nothing more than a very little incremental improvement rather than a quantum leap. Um, some of these things, uh, for example, GIS, uh, I was one of those people back in the, uh, the, 19, uh, the 1990s convincing our exploration managers to invest in GIS because we were going to solve all of their problems. But in reality, all it did was allow them to produce fancy maps on the uh, tops of computers and if anything, it, uh, it moved the task of producing maps away from a cartographic department to the actual, uh, the actual geologists themselves. All these ideas of uh, using fancy uh, algorithms to help you find mineral deposits, none of that has ever come to fruition, and uh, I seriously doubt uh, within the next couple of years that any of it actually, uh, actually will. GIS is little more than a map, a map making platform, that's all it's essentially used for. When I get to my own field of uh, geochemistry, um, there are two things there, ICPMS and FPXRF, that are often touted as the, uh, the big uh, game changers in, um, in mineral exploration. But um, ICPMS was nothing more than, yet again, an incremental change. It allowed us to analyze for up to uh, 82 elements, if you want, the whole periodic table that's, uh, that's not radioactive. But in reality, you go and look at uh, most exploration projects, and out of those um, it's typically 54 element packages, you find they're looking at three or four elements. They're essentially looking at the commodities, and there are very few companies actually make whole-scale use of all of that data. So having that fantastically low detection limits and that complete range of elements have actually added very little to the uh, to the work that they were doing. Uh, FPXRF is one of those that always amuses me uh, because uh, the vendors really enjoy it, uh, really enjoy it because it's a, it's, it, for them it's a quantum change. In reality all it did was allow us to go back to the, uh, the era of the 1960s, 1970s when we were all out in the field producing poor quality, uh, cheap data. Um, those days by doing acid digestion finished with an AA. Um, and FPXRF is pretty well doing the same thing. It usually sits not out in the field, but uh, in a uh, camp somewhere, and uh, people bring samples into it, sit the samples on it, and again look at the same three or four elements that they ever would have for their um, for their exploration project. It actually hasn't made a uh, great uh, great change, and if anything, it's a cast back to the uh, to the dark days of uh, to the dark days of exploration. Uh, the problem is that there's there's a whole generation of people who never saw what it was we were doing in the uh, 1980s and 1990s. So they view many of these things as new whiz bang toys, whereas in fact um, they aren't whiz bang toys. They're uh, they're small changes in what we're uh, what we're doing. There's also a whole pile of what I call flash in the pan uh, technology, or sometimes I prefer to call it wizardry, but things like selective extractions, MMI, SGH, enzyme leach, none of the major companies use those anymore because they, they don't actually do anything for the uh, for their exploration. They're uh, commercial, uh, technical inventions, they, uh, the juniors love them because they believe that they're going to give them the, uh, the silver bullet answer, but uh, it doesn't. It's, um, it's things that are really, really poorly understood, very poorly, uh, very poorly developed. No great, deal of <coughs> no great deal of science went into developing them. No great deal of science has ever applied to them since then. Uh, many of them are, um, are uh, proprietary methods, so your chance of actually using some science to see what they're really, really supposed to be doing is, uh, is very limited. Uh, technology isn't a silver bullet. It's provides nothing more than the incremental layers to improve our decision, uh, decision making process. And we can't use it to get around the complexity of the problem. We may be able to use some nice selective extraction, for example, but the fact is if we don't understand the changes in the regolith on the surface, the, uh, the changes in the till, for example, in Canada, uh, we're wasting our time trying to use some fancy uh, technique. 
Um, and then if technology succeeds, we often make it fail. Uh, I've seen this happen so many times in geophysics, and it was mentioned earlier on. Um, Angleloo flew spectrum across the Hudson Bay uh, region and did a beautiful job of uh, finding the, uh, the BMS deposits. They then flew it across the rest of the world and uh, didn't get a great deal of success for it, but its own success with its own, um, with its own demise at the end of the day. I had to work forward on my computer, but it's not going to happen. Um, research and development. Um, how many more theses do we need on more deposits? There are a little more than uh, copycat research. I sometimes have the feeling that a, a really, really bright student would actually go into the archives, pull out somebody else's thesis, and just go through it and bulk change the name of the deposit for the, uh, the deposit they're supposed to be working on. Because a lot of the time, all we're doing is generating more data without actually uh, improving the work that we're doing in terms of, uh, in terms of exploration. And unfortunately, I, I've, I always get the feeling there's too many examples where people are forcing data into old ideas rather than trying to come up with new ideas and new, um, new, uh, new concepts. Um, there's a problem of lost re research, uh, repeat research. Um, there's, uh, Peter Bradshaw always talks about the fact that uh, nobody ever reads anything older than 10 years, um, 10 years ago in the literature. So we end up re-repeating um, research-wise a lot of what we're, uh, what we're doing. And unfortunately, I think, or it's fortunate, I think uh, research is often focused on um, the production of high-quality people. It's not focused on what the actual research is supposed to be doing for us, the development that we're supposed to be getting out of the, uh, the research. Uh, a prime example of that, uh, I was recently asked to, uh, to be an external examiner on a PhD uh, to university and I uh, said fine, it was uh, biology and chemistry of uh, trees looking for mineral deposits, brilliant. And um, it turns out it's run by the geography department. You wonder what the hell is a geography department doing uh, biology and chemistry for mineral deposits? Really, really strange. Um, I think far too much of research is redundant on completion. Essentially, uh, once the thesis gets finished, it gets stuck in a cupboard. Fine, we've made a brilliant, bright student. Um, he's got himself an MSc, he's got himself a PhD. The research he did often disappears and uh, never sees the face of uh, the earth again unless it comes out in a couple of papers themselves, which uh, um, are often too focused to actually be a great deal of use for anybody else. Another paper on fluid inclusions, for example. Um, and then the one that uh, really got me was the, the complete lack of critical research teams. Um, I'm reading a book at the moment which uh, is all about the development of the atom bomb. And it's phenomenal that in a 30 year period they went from the discovery of the neutron through to developing uh, the atom bomb and, uh, and all the uh, atomic energy that goes with it. And when you look at the, uh, the way that they put together a fantastic research team to do that sort of thing, you look at the research teams we have at the moment and you can see that's never going to happen because the research teams that we have do not have the same common goal that those, uh, that those people had. Uh, people are disparate, they've got their own self-interest, as was mentioned earlier on, uh, often poorly focused. And I think um, it's an ill-defined question. We we don't actually ask the questions that we need to uh, we need to be asking of where we're uh, where we're going. And that's something that certainly needs to uh, needs to be uh, changed because of, um, it's a huge problem. And then finally, strategy. <coughs> I think. Um, I don't think anybody's going to disagree with anything on here. One of the biggest problems we have in exploration is I think far too many explorationists are now doing a job rather than doing exploration. They wake up in the morning, they sit with a recipe book telling them how they do exploration, and they do it without actually really thinking about how do we find what we're trying to, uh, what we're trying to find. We're looking for this type of deposit, this type of environment, what are the best tools that are available to actually apply and to use. Um, as an example, um, I worked with a company who'd come up with a fantastic exploration strategy for finding um, IOCG deposits down in the Carajas, and they were phenomenally successful at doing that. They took that same exploration strategy and they applied it to looking for porphyry deposits, looking for um, carbonatite uh, phosphate deposits, and it was a phenomenal waste of money. They were doing 40 meter, sorry, 40 foot space sampling across the top of porphyry deposits. So absolute craziness. Phenomenal amount of money uh, wasted. Um, linking budgets to KPIs is, uh, is a brilliant one. I saw eight, drill, eight holes drilled on a project solely because the KPI of the exploration manager said he had to have a certain meter of mil, uh, certain meterage of drilling done before the end of the uh, before the end of the year. So he's stuck in eight holes. They were really poorly defined um, defined exploration holes. 
Now, one of the things that I, uh, the last company I worked with did get right was that they actually built a team of uh, key experts. And the job of those key experts was to actually go around to the exploration projects and do a proper audit of them and tell them essentially what they were going to do next on the basis of um, on the basis of the, uh, the available information and the, and the environment. Unfortunately, that team had no responsibility. We couldn't force them to do the work. We could only make a recommendation that they did the actual work, which is often the problem with uh, with experts that we have no. Um, we have no um, um, responsibility to actually make something uh, make something happen. And of course, as soon as the downturn happens, the first thing that happens is every one of those members of that uh, of that super team all disappeared off because uh, the exploration company couldn't afford us anymore. Um, the uh, the whole thing was um, was put down. So yes, um, at the end of the day, um, I think there's a, there's a phenomenal thing, amount of things that uh, that we need to uh, need to change, both in the strategy, in the way that uh, we approach research, the way we um, work with uh, industry to uh, to uh, approach research, and particularly in context of, uh, of exactly what technology uh, technology is expected to do for us, whether we're really expected to make phenomenal quantum leaps or whether um, it is really nothing more than a uh, than an incremental um, an incremental change in terms of uh, in terms of exploration uh, I think that was my uh, part I'm glad I'm the uh, the first speaker this morning because I feel sorry for speaker number 22 on the list <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna have a nightmare of a time trying to think of something original <laughs> They get the bottle of wine. Thanks, Peter.